I think about like a military strategy, no matter what we do. All right, we're good. We're good. Can you hear me in the back? I'm just projecting for that. All right, awesome. Welcome to the talk. We really appreciate you coming, especially the last few numbers here at 2 o'clock. Uh, what are we talking about today is the active cyber defense cycle. Cyber active defense in general, as I mentioned, military strategy, we're going to go over a little introduction of key points to it. But then the cycle itself is something we've been using, especially from a security operations center kind of mind, uh, mindset model. And so I'll talk about what works for us. I am no way in front of say, here is the strategy that will fix all your problems. I'm not selling anything, it's not as important. But I'm going to try to tell you what works for me and what's worked for people that I work with, and we'll see where we can. Alright, so all I really care to cover today, and it's nice to do a bottom line right, is what is active defense, how do I achieve it, and then sort of walk through the site for itself. It's the same kind of thing when I talk about threat intelligence, there's generally three questions for it. What is it, how do I use it, when can I use it? Same kind of model of active defense. So, yay, there's me. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I am course author over at SANS, the threat intel class and the active defense class on the ICS or industrial control system side. Uh, my past life was working in the intelligence community from a national SOC threat operations center kind of perspective. Basically, go out and various sources of methods, find bad guys, bringing it to Rick Motors or tell the policymakers what kind of perspective. And now I do a lot with policy in New America. There's nothing like going to talking to Congress leaders and trying to tell them about security. It's kind of interesting. So here's my takeaways for you. If you leave this presentation just understanding what active defense is and is not, and you understand one approach for achieving it, I'll have done my job. Now, the other thing that I do in the community to keep my own sanity, and I started doing this when I was in the military, and again, to keep my sanity, is that I write comics. My big thing is that I can break down an argument I have with someone into a three or four pain comic. I feel I've done my job. And my dream, my absolute number one goal, is to get to the point where I enter an argument with someone and can just keep referencing them to my comics for every part of the argument and just win that way. I'll know that I've done my job correctly. So, what is active cyber defense mean, little Bobby? All right, well, it's when people actively look to respond to and monitor for their threats. It's not half that. No, that's some aspect of offense or intelligence. The little Bobby actually says, well, that sounds harder to market. All right, so active defense is a buzzword. We have for quite a while heard the term active defense bubble up. Active defense tends to be a giant buzzword in the infosec community. Is one of those concepts that fits into a little bit security, but a lot of strategy, especially old school strategy, has been around long before the word cyber. We generally see some folks come out like dark figure saying current IT security practices break down into one of four steps find the code, unplug the device, patch the device, put it back on. If that's your defense strategy, then I really don't care what you have to say about active defense because you have a lot more things to do first, right? We also see a lot of this whole, like, it's not technically hacking back, which is pretty hilarious to me. Uh, it's, it's not hardcore offense, right? So I worked on the military side of the house doing an offense team for a while, and we never had software and hardcore offense. It was just one approach to doing offense. So I'm not exactly sure what they're referring to here. Um, then we have great quotes like, it's literally a wild west out there, and a hack back means shutting down an attack coming after you, or stealing your data back once they've taken it. No, it's gone, don't, don't worry about it. Okay, it's left through network, we're not getting the F-35 back from China. Okay? <laughs> so, you see that in the security community, a lot of security experts talking about active defense, but you also see the mix up on the academia side. So you get a lot of academics, uh, I can sort of make fun of academics now, I'm doing a PhD, policy, all that good stuff. I feel like I'm actually go at them now. My whole purpose for getting a PhD was when my board asked me, why do you want a PhD? And I told them, I just hate getting in arguments with people that say, mm, yeah, I'm a PhD. I just want to be able to say, I've got one too, now shut up and talk to me. That's the entire purpose. So when we look at academics talking about cyber, a lot of them are very intelligent and in those roles for a reason, about policymakers, Harvard Law School professors, etc. A lot of them don't have hands-on keyboard experience at all, no understanding of security, and they get into suggesting these one-on-one -on -one tactics of security as the end-all and be -all, which they're useful, but they don't fix everything. One of the problems, though, is they take terms like active defense and copy and paste it into the realm of cybersecurity. So then we'll talk about the next little slide. There are strategies in the military dating way back 
what an active defense is, including counterattacking. But as I'll sort of walk through, a counterattack in our environments is much closer to incident response than it is hacking into their networks. So we see here active cyber defense refers to the offensive actions such as counter hacking, uh, counter hacking, preemptive hacking, and uh, hacking to target cyber threats. There's no preemptive hacking. This is not the push surge strategy. I don't really want to do preemptive hacking against China, right? Uh, the only, uh, see, advanced cyber attacks, are they really advanced? Most of the threats we see are some pretty basic stuff. I used to joke around with a lot of folks that on the intelligence community side of the house, there was no extra points for looking good at this first year report. All right, let's just sink that in for a second. If I had 10 things I had to do in a day, 10 different operations we had to run, in no case did I say, ooh, let's throw an extra zero day in there for the heck of it. Right? It's all about using whatever you can to get in and out and off your day. Your network is the most important network to you. It is not the most important network to the adversary, usually. They've got other things to do, and it turns out the government has a paperwork, bureaucracy, and PowerPoint, too. All right. So, when we look at the active defense influences, one of the ones that gets quoted the most is Mao. So, the Chinese Communist Party leader in the 1930s and 40s, Mao, is not the greatest cyber expert of all time. That being said, if you look at his understanding of active defense, he did say, defense for the purpose of counterattacking and taking the offense. Understood. Let's think about the context, not just a little translation, which this is English, not Mandarin, so we may be missing something. Else. But when we look at the actual discussion around what he was facing, it was in the context of the second Sino Japanese War. The Japanese armed forces were coming into China. He could not defend, Mao could not defend all of China. And he said, something we probably all heard, let's do the death by a thousand cuts strategy. Let's look for when they come in and instead of having decisive battles, we pick our battles and respond to them in our territory. We'll counterattack them in our territory. It was never about going back into Japan. So again, we look at what we understand of defense, it is a much more literal translation to instant response than it is hacking back. But also, if you just read the next paragraph, he contradicted himself anyway, so none of these experts on Mondays tend to go through the next paragraph and just find the one they want to cite it. I always love going through academic papers, you find them with one sentence on these sites, and the whole paper is saying the exact opposite, but you got your citations and pairs. Right? So, what well, Mao understood. Mao understood his forces would be the underdogs, or hackers have the upper hand. He understood that he could not protect all the land he had, he had no vulnerabilities. He understood his environment or network and his people or sensors had to do this whole aspect of war of the people. He could use everything that we have to identify when, in this case, the Japanese were coming in. And he understood that decisive battles or single force of failure would ultimately lead to his destruction. So his aspect was never about offense, it was about understanding and using his territory for the benefit of security. Other uh, aspects of active defense, you would generally find that other people reference the Air Force's uh, air and missile nuclear defense strategy, as well as uh, General DuBois in 1976 field manual operations uh, manual that talked about active defense, or the Israeli Iron Dome. When you look at each one of these strategies, without bringing a lot of boring context to the security conference, when you look at these strategies, a significant portion of what they were referring to is how to identify when someone broke past the front lines and maintaining a maneuverable reserve defense force to swing around and counter that break through the counter uh, front lines. In other words, when they get through your perimeter, how do you find and fix them, right? Not counterattacking. So active defense takeaways, if you look from a historical standpoint, this nice little Biden is feel about now and army, we find out that active defense is still about defense. Turns out, putting the word cyber in front of something doesn't mean it means the opposite, right? So defense is still about defense. And the active approach is all about monitoring your area responsibility. It's about responding to those incidents and attacks, changing yourself in the face of those attacks, or learning from your engagements, and applying those lessons learned and sharing them with your other teams or other peers in the community. Right? That's the entire approach around an active defense. That's what it is. So how do I achieve an active defense? Well, thank you, Little Lobby, for setting me up. Why well, have traditional security methods failed? Well, most people do not actually do traditional security, so when they don't do, uh, when, when something fails with what they didn't do, they blame traditional security. And of course, Little Lobby astutely says, well, maybe not doing security is traditional security. So as I build up to this gay active defense, security operations centers, threat intelligence kind of mindset, 
I want to frame the discussion and talk about what I call the sliding scale of cybersecurity. So if anybody's interested in a long paper on it, post a paper this week, uh, detail each category and what all this means. I'll walk through the slides here next. But the whole concept here is there's generally buckets of resource investments and actions you can take that contribute to security. I laid, uh, named out five, architecture, passive events, active events, intelligence, and offense. The goal of security, in my mind, is to get to that left side of the scale. More secure architecture by design, taking our lessons learned along the way and forcing it into good architecture. Even though Intel sounds a lot sexier than active events and sounds a lot sexier than passive events, the goal is to move in that direction. You've done your job and you've automated yourself out of that job, right? You're trying to move the bar. So let's walk through what this means. First of which, architecture. Architecture is all about planning, designing, and maintaining those systems with security in mind. We all kind of have a firm grasp on this, but this is the one that most of the community struggles with. When I go in and do instant response in an organization, a significant portion of my time is just finding your critical assets, finding your critical information. Well, we've all known that a lot of incident response is planning ahead of time. The architecture piece is something that defenders should have and adversaries should have to work to get. So not thinking of people, not thinking of processes, but just from a technical standpoint, defenders have an upper hand over the offense. They start or should start in a place where you know your data flows, you know your assets, you know what's on your network, you understand the software, etc. You have a much better, richer knowledge than the adversary. I sometimes hear a lot of defender narratives in the community, well the adversary only has to get it once. I don't know what adversary team you've been on, but that's not true. The adversary's got to get it once, which all their clients have been ahead of time, all sorts of violent movement, got to find your information that they're looking for in your poorly maintained network, Identify ways to get it out without you catching them, and then leave before you call mandate crowd strike dispersity someone else, and then make it national news, which is just embarrassing for a lot of policymakers. So that adversary perspective is not as easy as people like to think. So there's not enough people that are stupid to go talk about offense. They're usually pretty smart, but they actually were on an offense team. They don't get up on stage to talk about it. So those folks aren't generally contributing to the discussion. But from an architecture standpoint, a lot of what we need is this. A lot of the higher-end security tactics that we try to employ fail because people don't have a good grasp of their own architecture. So pitfalls, right? Leaving it's unmanageable, you can start somewhere. Uh, in the when I was on the pure defense intel perspective, we had 4.4 million IP connected devices. We started with finding networks that were critical to us, mapping them out, understanding them, baseline as much as we could, and spreading from there. It takes a long time. It's not easy. Defense is not easy, but it is doable. The aspect of not guiding tech refreshes and upgrades. Basically, if you have an environment where you know you have a dump switch, and then you just can't get full packet capture from it, you're not going to get net flow from it, you don't have any opportunity to do anything there besides manually going and doing attack. Identifying that putting a managed switch in there will then make a business case for security later on with reducing cost for instant response, with understanding your threats, etc. That is a good tactic of good tactic to be able to lose your PowerPoint slides to ultimately go and understand where I need to upgrade this later on. So your architecture people need to be plugged into the security process so they see the end goal and we can use those tech refreshes, those upgrades, etc. along the way. Big wins is at the very basic level of having an understanding of what assets you have and the topologies. Does your domain controller usually go to Iran.com? If not, you should know that first, right? That very basic aspect of topologies is something a lot of us can get away with. On the enterprise security side, a lot of what I've ever dealt with for having all the data was some after-the-fact net flow and maybe memory off of a host. And we still find the badness with that. We do a lot of net flow and memory. But if, as you get more and understand more data from your environment, a lot of security practices get fairly easy. All right, continuous monitoring for vulnerabilities and security issues. I do like to see organizations do that, but not as their security strategy. Maintaining your architecture is just a basic aspect of having architecture. It's not defense. You're not a, and the military struggles with this, you're not a cyber defender for patching the system. I'm sorry. It's really important, probably more important than a lot of things. But it's not defense, it's architecture, and you should be doing it on a regular basis. Passive defense. Passive defense is all about putting things on top of the architecture. It's not contributing to whatever the goal of the architecture is, 
but it's adding those uh, abilities to deny adversaries or keep insights into uh, infrastructure and Windows threats. Basically, if you leave it at the end of the night and go home and it does something for you against an adversary, it's a passive defense. There's a lot of people out there who want to talk about tools being active defense, they're not. And it's good that they're not. It sounds better to say that active defense, but we want them to be passive defense. We need them to work without little Bobby on the keyboard 24 7. We want them to do their job even passively, right? So big pitfalls for that is just understand the tool's purpose. A lot of people like to throw in like a sim and say, oh, the sim will take everything. No, you gotta put the analysts on there, they gotta be trained, they gotta do all sorts of stuff with it. Uh, not maintaining your defenses, not actually performing defensive depth. Uh, before I got out of the Air Force, one of the things I got asked to do was validate what they were saying with the network gateways. They said, hey, we've got these giant new firewalls from company X, and company X is gonna deploy these firewalls. I said, cool, are you doing like defense in depth? Yes. Let's show me. So when I went to look at it, they had one physical server with two virtual machine firewalls, and that was their DMC. And both firewalls were from the same manufacturer, the same version, and had the same rule set. That's not defense and depth, right? You have the firewalls, but they're just passive at that point. So understanding and using defense and depth smartly in your organization is a good opportunity because the only thing you really reduce on the adversary generally is their time. The big cost to adversary groups is time. When you can Limit that down, you've actually reached success. Wins, smartly applied them. If you understand your architecture correctly, you can make better informed and prioritized decisions about where to place your passive defenses. That's when you do a good job. The downside is when you have no clue about your architecture, but you know you need a firewall. So now your firewall ingress and egress rules aren't actually matching the real environment. It's often some network section that nobody knew about. And oh, you've got three enclaves that are directly connected to the internet that no one detected. Right, so understanding your architecture helps guide those passive defenses. What about active events? So active events, again, is the process of those analysts, so big focus on the human here, monitoring, responding to, learning from threats in their environment. The big focus is that the reason the advanced persistent threat is so advanced has nothing to do with their ability to use a Metasploit module or an ODIG. It has to do with understanding the difference between the two. We've seen adversaries get into, it was the same adversary group. It was a Canadian company and a US company. The Canadian company had really good security. They were using like Bit9 whitelisting solutions, all sorts of fun stuff. They misconfigured the device. The adversary got in with this national level adversary, they used a couple of days, did some really sweet stuff to get in there. Pivoted into the US company and found that it wasn't very maintained and they were using Metasploit models. The adversary changed their tactics and the advanced things that they're doing specifically off what the defender's capabilities were. Why try to ruin the sexy stuff? There's no way to work, right? So, active defense, the reason that those adversaries are good is because they're intelligent and they're flexible. So, the only real way to counter an intelligent, flexible, and persistent adversary is to have highly trained and empowered defenders. Right, big focus on them power as well. If your active defender can't even do anything in the environment with policy restrictions, you don't have a Chinese issue, you have a management issue, and you gotta go address that first. Wins, working with the architecture and passive defense team to guide those strategies. For example, if you're an active defender, you're using network security monitoring, you find that you can't get the data, you find that uh, you go into the network and there's just no ability to get data whatsoever, dump switch, etc. Working with those architecture teams to say, hey, it would really help out us if you go this direction instead, and then we can do security better later on. Same thing with passive events. Hey, you are not configuring up your firewalls to send us the logs we need. You have to look through it. That's an issue for us, right? Working with those teams to make win. The other piece is developing those analytics to automate workflows. We also hear a lot of buzzwords around that in the community, but in general, the less your active analysts have to do, the better. They need to come in and have a plan every day about how they're going to attack the problem. And generally, you can use automation to get them to a starting place, and then they can run from there. But if they walk in every day and are told to find the unknown unknowns, they're not going to really have a lot of work, right? So that was my life for a while, working on the national SOC kind of perspective, where I was told to go find the things the intelligence community didn't know about. Oh, okay. Um, what do you want to do? Find new nation states we've never heard of before breaking into the country. Oh, uh, okay, look at the network, you see Cerio tunnels, Bitcoin mining, etc. all sorts of architectural issues, really bad passive defenses. It's really hard to find Russia and China in your network if you have giant architectural issues. It all looks the same. So working with those teams to rule out the noise makes your active defenders useful. 
again, if they have this trouble through finding all the good stuff inside the noise, you're going to have a bad time. But what about intelligence? It is ironic enough that intelligence is one of the least understood things. Most organizations want to sprinkle threat intel on top of the problem, thinking that it fixes everything. But what they don't understand is they have no concept of what their threat is, and they have no concept of what intel is. A random IP address coming into your environment is not an intelligence feed, it's a data feed. It may be useful, you might find value out of it, but understand what it is. Good example. What is a threat? A threat has to have the capability, opportunity, and hostile intent to do harm to be a threat. We, the uh, UK version of the NSA is the GCHQ. If the GCHQ ever wanted to screw over the US government, they could. Because they have all the capability and all the opportunity for connected networks to do whatever they want. But they have no hostile intent, so the GCHQ is not a threat to the US government. I work with a large scale car manufacturer in Germany, take your pick, and they wanted to instantly go to instant response after Barclay came out. There was this open SSL vulnerability that came out, and they said, OMG, well, this is going to be really effective to what we do. Let's take off instant response. So well, that's kind of a bad idea. Shut up, American for minutes response. Okay, whatever. Um, so they spent a lot of money to find out that they never had that version of OpenSSL in their environment. All right. So they had no understanding of the opportunity that the adversary might have. There was somebody using Hartley. There was the Hartley vulnerability, but no opportunity in their environment to do them any harm. Most organizations are not mature enough. And this is not to say shame, shame, shame. It's a very hard problem. Most organizations are not mature enough to answer what their threat is. Therefore, any value they get out of threat intelligence is going to be very lessened because of that. You will get some threat intelligence, but it may not be your threat intelligence. The organizations that can accurately answer the capability, opportunity, and hostile intent have a really good understanding of architecture, passive events, and active threats. They're doing the building blocks and that foundation to get to this level. We see a lot of companies that say, oh, well, JP Morgan, USAA, some of these large companies, they're doing security well. What's your secret? And their CISO will be like, ah, we're using a lot of threat intelligence. No. And so they'll run off and say, I want threat intelligence. The answer was that JP Morgan, USAA, a couple of large companies have done a really good job over the years of understanding their architecture, deploying passive defenses, setting up their active defense teams. And then they got to a point where threat intelligence could contribute to what they were doing. But it doesn't fix what they don't have. Right. So to me, there's some good uh, sort of indicators of if you're using threat intelligence correctly. For example, if your executives at the board level can name the last APT campaign that you dealt with, that to me is a good indication that your executives are on board and that your threat intelligence team is doing a good job. Just be able to name it, right? I don't need board of directors understanding what you mitigated, the firewall rules, whatever. Just be able to name the campaign. At your CISO level, or that kind of level, they should be able to name the threats that are ongoing in their industry. They have that situational awareness around them. Your threat intelligence teams should be the first to tell them. If your CISO learns about campaign X to financial industry from anyone other than your threat intelligence team, your threat intelligence team has failed you. Right? That's their number one job. In addition to that, a little nice little story, uh, is to dispel the hype. So there's this nice company out there, it's a shoe company I really like a lot. And they have one of the most impressive threat intel teams I've ever seen. Like the shoe company, really. Whole long story why they did it. But their biggest output is at 8 o'clock every morning to the board of directors and the company executives. They send out a report that says, here's what you heard in the news last night and why it was not applied to us. That way, right from the beginning, they stop anybody calling in, sort of grinning down, like, hey, do you know about this? Oh, where we go? Why didn't you tell me? They stop that whole process right from the beginning so the security teams can focus on security instead of answering questions from up and high, right? So it's a good use as well. The big thing about threat intelligence teams that I dislike is a lot of them will choose formats that they like. Open, open IFC, Yara, Stix, Taxi, whatever, what makes their life easier. The big value of a threat intelligence team is driving the security architecture of your organization. You should be putting everything in the formats that they use. If your responders only use Open IOC, congratulations, your formats and your IOCs better be in Open IOC. Nobody likes when somebody from a new fancy team comes in and says, Stop what you're doing, I fixed the problem, you need to do this now instead. You're going to lose a lot of friends very quickly, right? What about offense? Nope, don't prove it. Here's why. 
There are very few organizations that I've never seen that have done all that we've talked about correctly to get to the point to be able to do offense and find any value out of it. Everybody wants to talk about going back and doing offense as if it provides any aspect of security. It doesn't. Uh, it can contribute to security at that higher level analysis, especially the policy level, and maybe if the U.S. wants to do something against North Korea or so forth. There's legal countermeasures and the legal abilities to do offense that can contribute. It's nothing your organization is going to do. More than likely, you're going to mess up somebody else's operation or campaign or some ongoing intelligence operation. You're not going to help out at all. And if you're spending money on offense, which, by the way, if you can't do patching of your equipment, you probably can't run an offensive campaign. But if you are spending money on offense and it still have priorities that need to be filled on those architecture, past events, active events, and so, you are doing your company a disservice. So plain and simple, I just do not agree with companies doing offense. Uh, there are like two or three that have made it to the level they probably could, and their resources are better invested talking to policymakers in Congress, talking about sanctions on China and so forth, than it is about standing for their offense teams. So the big takeaway here, though, is that the foundation must be present. To do offense correctly requires you to understand what you're going up against, so you got to have that architecture, pass and that's active events, and to do intel. The biggest resource expenditure on the government of running an offense team was the giant intelligence apparatus that had to go behind it to support it. So regardless of you thinking it's that one exploit or not, the most expensive thing you can do is run an offensive uh, team. The next thing is intel, down to active events, passive events, etc. So we took the value towards security, getting it right the first time, moving up, right? And the cost on the side, this makes a nice ROI. We see a good return on investment to our resource investors. So we see that to do active events, if I want to stay on the stock, I really need to be investing those passive events and those architecture big expenditures to be able to support us at that stage anyways. And if anybody sort of wants to jump straight to Intel, you got to ask what they're using it for, right? Another thing, though, is the community doesn't generally understand the difference between generating or consuming intelligence. And I'll get to that in a second. One of the places you will find a lot of sort of active defense mindsets taking place is those security operations centers. Instead of giving a whole talk about that, I just link down here at the bottom. Uh, at least Alyssa is an <coughs> awesome person who's done a nice little white paper on running a SOC and sort of what it looks like from a high level. To me, if you look at a SOC, though, it's not about patching and finding vulnerabilities or running Nessus. It's about finding the adversary and responding to it. Well, why do we see a lot of patch vulnerability management, et cetera, go to the SOC? Because there tends to be a communication issue in our industry. Well, you're the cyber guy. You should go to the team with all the cyber people and do the cyber stuff, right? You hear that a lot. Like, oh, you, you do cyber stuff. Go over there. Now, we need to be able to break that out and understand what our actions are actually contributing to. So, to me, a network validation team is not something you should throw in a sock. To me, there should be dedicated teams for that. And there actually should be a little bit of competition back and forth to get those nicely working together. I'm not going to dictate the organization though, there's always exceptions, but I would just say the big thing with SOC is that active defense piece. All right, so a lot of lead up, 30 minute lead up, just get to the whole point of the presentation. The active cyber defense cycle. That's what Bobby says. Uh, is it unfair that China always gets blamed for computer breaches? Yes. Other countries do the same or similar things. We have to keep an open mind and be critical of the evidence. Okay, which country is most responsible then? China. So, we do have an understanding of the community. It's on the geopolitical actors we face with. We have an understanding of uh, all sorts of things around that. My problem here is a lot of people will bias themselves right out of the game. Oh, it's going after financial data. It's probably Russia, not China. Oh, it's going after intellectual property. It's probably China, not Russia. Your defenders using experience to understand teams is fine. When you're doing threat intel or so that active defense, you get paid to defeat your biases. Your entire paycheck comes down to ruling out your so-called experience and biases and looking at it from an analytical perspective and trying to come to a good conclusion. As an example, uh, those organizations back in the day used to think, oh, China smashed the trap, that's all they did. No, that's all you saw. There was like 300 offense teams in China. There's some of them that do actually smash the trap, and there's some that are your tier one operators that you'll never see and they're really, really good. We can't just label the entirety of the country based on what we have observed inside our networks. So the active cyber defense cycle, everyone's got to have a model. Here's mine. Uh, for me, it's all about consuming intelligence to drive the process, right? Taking threat intelligence, consuming it, driving the asset identification, the network security monitoring that takes place. 
From there, understanding it's not just about intrusions, it's about campaigns of adversaries. So you jump up to the answer response phase. And then lastly, that threat environment manipulation focus. And I'll walk through these and stand appreciate there's a huge difference in doing models like the cyber kill chain, designing models, gathering, collecting, analyzing information into intelligence, et cetera, than there is of knowing how to weed out the hype and find the things that are relevant to you. They're actually different skill sets. Realistically, most organizations want company teams that know how to consume intelligence. They really don't want you to know how to generate intelligence usually. They want you to know how to get the information you need to make them more successful. So that aspect of threat intelligence consumption can usually be broken into three levels. Uh, strategic, operational, tactical. At the strategic level, that's where threat intelligence should start in my opinion. I've seen a lot of folks want to advocate from a tactical level, oh, we can drive this process and get buy from the organization. Uh, as much as I love being a tactical person, if your executives don't have buy-in to start with, it's going to be a long process and take a lot more effort to lead up than it will lead down. Your executives are a great place to start with threat intelligence because they get an understanding of the business value of security and the threats you're actually facing. So they need to have clearly stated questions, knowledge gaps, right? The big thing about intelligence is something that satisfies a knowledge gap, not just answering your yes or no information question. Data are those IP addresses, MD5 dashes, etc. Data with context is an indicator. Indicators and information or threat information can answer a yes or no question. Is the malware on this computer? Yes, that's threat information. Intelligence work is all about analysis. Intelligence won't give you a yes or no answer. It can't. By its very core nature, it can't. It'll tell you, I see tanks on the border of Russia. Or I see tanks on the border of Crimea. Right? Yes or no answer? Yes. Good information product was satellite open. I see Putin talking about going into Crimea and making very big rhetoric. Yes or no information? Yes, he is. And I see military buildups and secret sort of organizations infiltrating into Crimea to prepare the battle. Yes, I can say that. From all of those three pieces of information, I can assess with high confidence that Russia is going to invade Crimea. I've made an intelligence assessment based off information. Most organizations don't want that. They want threat information. They want to say, is the malware on my network? How do I find it? Right? So we just we see a gap in that intelligence community mindset right out the get go. But if you have known intelligence gaps, you can drive your intelligence process. Your operational folks can make sure they marry up the strategic goals to what's going on at the tactical level. They can say, hey, we're dealing with a lot of memory-based malware. I don't have anybody on my team that knows how to do memory forensics. So I'm either going to peer up with another organization, or I'm going to staff and maintain some memory forensic analysts. They see the bigger picture of the threats you're facing and prioritizes their investments. At the tactical level, it's usually about finding that intelligence you can consume, like IOCs, TTPs, etc. These nice little packaged environments to sort of drive the process. From there, we get into the aspect of asset identification and network security monitoring. Since most organizations do not have the ability to know everything in their environment. The people who are out hunting, those network screen monitoring analysts, are in a great position to tell you what they're seeing. They should be documenting along the way. So the network security monitoring, the whole aspects, collecting, detecting, and we see at learning, but it's really analyzing. Um, so finding sources of data in your network, whether it's host-based logs or network traffic, but something in the network, you find the, the evidence, you find the collection of source of data. You use your threat information as well as known baselines, anomalies, etc. Detect something, and then you analyze it and determine if it's something that can be quickly fixed, and it's like a policy issue, or is it something that actually needs instant response? And that's the whole model behind network security monitoring. It's just really looking forward and going and doing security in your network. But it's also all about helping drive this instant response perspective. So, what does an instant response look like in the actual defensive mindset? To me, the old school NIST model is great. Don't get me wrong, I'm going to prepare, I'm going to plan, I'm going to collect, I'm going to attack. The problem I have with that is most of us, or most of our organizations, don't have on site instant response teams fully maxed out that are consistently looking to collect and attack on malware. They just don't have it. To me, the NIST model may be a little bit idealistic. In the realistic world, you'll have the network security monitoring uh, analysts that are actually identifying something happened, and they'll call in the instant responders. And your instant responders nowadays usually don't clean up the systems either. They'll make recommendations. They'll say, I know that for this piece of malware you should do this, and uh, you should take these actions in your environment. But most enterprise organizations, most critical infrastructure sites, most large scale networks, 
you do not say, sure, it's a responder from the company, actually go for it and do whatever you want in our environment. The only time that happens is when like, you're OPM and you're entirely screwed, you just say, anybody help me? That can sometimes take place. So from the incident response perspective, though, it's a lot about planning and training ahead of time. We still don't take that out. We'd like to see incident responders get involved in that cycle, and they should know the network screen monitoring analysts. They should know those personnel before they come on site. It's bad on day one to have to do introductions and three cups of teas with the Afghan chieftain, right? We need to have conversations ahead of time. They scope the infection, especially on a business impact of what security contributes to. We need to understand the impact of what we're facing and the scoping of that threat. So that's really what they're responsible for. They'll usually use the network security monitoring personnel to sort of guide those actions for them and help them act like targeteers to what they're doing. They collect the forensic data. It's really about what incident response is about anyways. The deep forensic analysis is something else. And maintain safe and reliable operations. Five nines and Amazon uh, power staying up at a speed site. Whatever it is, that safe and reliable operations that are consistent is what they're trying to maintain. And then ultimately, they'll make suggestions for the cleanup. They, they generally don't do the cleanup anymore themselves. What about threat environment manipulation? Well, first of all, it's all about decompletion. If the threat is malware based and it's already known, there's no reason to spin up whole team to deal with it. Figure out what you should already know about it and move from there. The other aspect of it is, is it's not always malware, so I don't say malware analysis. We deal with threats that are interactive operators, we deal with people actually in the networks using access. And it also gets in a bad mindset when you assume the threat is the capability. The threat is the person behind the keyboard. That's what you're going to battle with, right? So that threat environment manipulation piece is understanding the threat to drive the rest of the process and prioritize your effects, as well as understanding your environment to make recommendations to those passive and architecture teams to be able to make those changes. Hey, this piece of malware, you can by rain.com, all we gotta do is see the bullet and we buy ourselves some time. Great thing to know from that malware analysis kind of effect. Uh, that, that prioritization piece is very critical. This past year, 2014, uh, there was two attacks that compromised the industrial control system community. In the history of public ICS attacks, there have been three pieces of malware specifically targeted to ICS and SCADA stuff. Stuxnet, Live TV, uh, 2 and 3, and Havix. Two of those happened this last year. So it was a big year for ICS community. When we look at the attack, they both take place, took place at about the same time. So the ICS served and everyone else doing the job had a real issue trying to prioritize do they go clean have actually or black energy. The malware analyst looked at black energy and said, hey, it has a destruction capability to delete information and destroy its aspects of systems. Havex is just scanning and doing nonsense. So they were able to prioritize black energy and make choices based off of that. That was a good use of that threat environment manipulation that team. So making those recommendations and understanding your threat, very Sun Tzu, isn't it? Know yourself, know the adversary, pretty basic stuff. Ultimately, people and processes outweigh the technology. Being a dirty vendor these days of software company, don't get me wrong, I like products. But the thing that I always champion out is it's far more about people and processes. We've had the technology to fix our problems for a long time. We want to do it better, we want to get better at it. And a lot of what we're doing with technology now is going to take the human out of it because we're really struggling with that. But people and processes far out of the way. Anything that technology is going to get you on that network. That flashing pretty little box gets you to a starting place. You've got to have training and power analysts to from there. So what about when you use that? Well, to me, like I mentioned earlier, those adversaries are going to look like whatever they get away from. The Havex malware, very targeted, definitely nation state, was using copy and pasted Metasploit modules for the initial effects. Like literally copy and pasted out of like rapid sentence kit. They were copy and pasted Metasploit modules, extremely effective, so that's what they did. Black energy, they had to target a little more sensitive environments, so they were using some cool little tactics. So if you're going up, and I put these threat categories, they aren't the threat categories, just to frame the discussion though. If you have like low level script kitties, traditional cyber crimes, those corporate or military kind of funded teams, and then foreign intelligence services, if you're not doing security, it's all going to look the same to you. Your people just have no idea what's the difference until they really are too far into the process that they've already failed to do that. If you do architecture to its hypothetical maximum, you're going to knock out the ability of any script kid or low level actor doing anything against you. At a hypothetical maximum. Then everything's got to look at least one way, right? Same thing going up the past the events, then you sort of knock out what your traditional cyber crime folks can do. Then you start seeing O days and kind of funding orchestrated teams, and then active defense is going to take care of that. When you're really dealing with foreign intelligence services, yeah, you do need intel to drive the process to get you there. I unfortunately also see a lot of people in the community say, well, how do I protect against the PLA, NSA, FSB, 8200? 
Um, how do you protect it against concrete? But let's start there, right? Like, yeah, let's start somewhere. So if your only threat is the NSA, MSB, PLA, A200, congratulations, you want security, but for the rest of us in your portals, I suggest we start somewhere before we're waiting, okay? So let's walk through a scenario and see the, this working in a very sort of hyper sped up instant response scenario. I can't show you real critical infrastructure data. Unfortunately, they get that sensitive about that. So I took a case I worked on and just built it in the lab and I'm going to walk through it. So scenario walk through here. Why would you try to redefine active events and include Intel offense actions? Well, little Bobby, many would like to do those actions. Uh, calling it active defense makes it sound less controversial. So little Bobby says, well, doing homework is now defined to play Minecraft. Okay. All right. So, Habex. We're going to walk through a little Habex case study here. Habex was one of those pieces of malware that I just thought was brilliant. As someone who's been on the other side of the government fence, I just thought we were put this together. I was giving a slow clap. It was brilliant. It was very basic in what it did, but the adversary knew their target very well. Specifically, it was scanning out for OPC servers in an industrial control system environment. There's very few commonalities. You have substation one and substation two in the same state owned by the same company contributing to the same grid, and they're completely configured differently. For adversaries to really get in and understand ICS it takes a long time. It, it's a complex problem. If you're trying to throw exploits or whatever, Siemens, whether you have the outcome, whatever, who knows, right? But the big thing in ICS is if you get access to the network, you get root access for everything. You just, instead of getting a group on the box, you just want to get a group on the network. Again, very few things are common. So this adversary knew that they wanted a lot of data. So they used one of the very few commonalities between large-scale ICS facilities, and that was OPC. OPC is a kind of universal protocol to get all the vendors to talk together, and it's consistent across a number of sites. So this was a, to me, it wasn't just a, a exploit, which is like, man, it wasn't just some sort of IVC would go off of. This was a true tactic they were using, and nice TTP was abusing this native OPC protocol. So very, very brilliant from an average range of type. It infected sites around the world. Just that we know of on reporting of, of victims, it infected well over 3,000 industrial control system sites around the world. Again, power grids, nuclear facilities, water facilities, uh, wind farms, not good stuff for an adversary to really know. And if you put it in the geopolitical context, it was right when all the sanctions against the Russian banks were going on, so none of us were too excited about what we were seeing and the potential follow on impact, right? So it was a bad deal. The thing that was sort of ironically funny with this is one of the original methods was phishing, right? It's the first. But then they had this water hole attack, basically, they went to the vendor websites and compromised it. You went to the vendor website and you compromised it. But the one that was just brilliant, that just really pissed all of us off in security, is we've been telling the ICS community for years, go patch your equipment, please go update the latest firmware, like let's start somewhere. So what they did is they had a Trojanized version of the installer for the firmware updates hosted on the vendor websites. So it was only when they would actually update their equipment when they got infected. So we're like, great, okay, now our whole message is gone, right? So that was great. And that was four years of successful operations. So let's walk through just the cycle real quick along with this. Most of us going to start from network security monitoring. Threat intelligence is great. We don't do predictive threat intelligence. If anyone wants to have a discussion about why predictive threat intelligence and what we'll talk about later. Generally, we usually start from a network security monitoring kind of perspective. If you didn't have this picture here, you'd have no idea coming in what CapEx was on what box, right? But if I knew ahead of time, hey, I have these assets in this dot 200 system, and I'm only using these ports for this ICS environment, then you go and you take a nice little Snapchat right here, nothing more than Wireshark endpoints. You can pick out, hey, uh, that dot 200 is doing some crazy stuff. There's all these other ports being accessed that aren't realistic to my environment. One of the beautiful things about ICS facilities is they're very static. You shouldn't have your nuclear negotiation, your nuclear operations facility going to Facebook. It just doesn't happen a lot, right? It doesn't go update its LinkedIn profile and tell it that it's still spinning the turbine. So ultimately, these networks are pretty static. And that's a great place to be. It's actually a learning lesson for the IT community. Having that baseline puts them in a really good position. So we have our little baseline over here. So we know just from abnormalities without indicators or anything else what's going on and what's potentially malicious. And from this, we can derive that the dot 200 is potentially infected. So we can drive our answer response team there. Answer response team goes on, and I've made it very easy, right? This nice little long hash uh, executable here. But all I did in red line was say, hey, what these little ports I saw with network security monitoring, what process is accessing these ports? If I didn't have the network security monitoring team piece to understand that, or the baseline to understand that, and pull the answer response data, it takes a long time to figure this out. But because I know, 
44818 for Ethernet IP is not in the message control system environment. Any process trying to send those commands that I saw in the packet capture is probably malicious, right? So I can hone in very quickly my answer response to that material. And all along, all that we're going through is we're picking out our key indicators that we want to have over time. From the threat environment regulation focus, we go and do a little bit of basic power analysis from the process we pulled out. Uh, generally, companies can't throw a lot of malware teams at things. You usually outsource this to some big companies, but everybody can have a sandbox on the site. It is not that complex to take Cuckoo Sandbox and figure it up to your site, not theirs, right? And I have a nice little Windows box with all your stuff on it, throw malware in there and see what happens. Anybody can do that. I have ICS organizations where everyone usually laughs at ICS, oh, ICS is so insecure. And they've got a nice sock running with automated sandboxes to analyze how they're throwing. You can do it too. All right, so we do this with the capabilities. We pull out a couple of key things right here. We've got this TCP IP parameters, right? It's got some sort of network capabilities. We can very easily pick out what this malware is doing just from analyzing very simple approaches in the automated sandbox. Specifically, we see this nice little trace DSCN.yl is down here. That is a nice indicator now. It's not some random piece of data. It's data with the context that it was maliciously doing something on the network or scanning out the environment. So with that understanding, we can kick all that stuff over to the threat intelligence consumption folks. They can go out with those indicators we found internal because the best threat intelligence you can get is internal threat data. And you can go dump it into like virus total intelligence, find out where it's been submitted before, grab hashes and related files, maybe some files that you didn't know existed in your environment, find new file names that have been associated with those pieces of malware and make indicators compromised for your cycle and team. And you can also see if anyone like Spursky has already said, yeah, this is happening. We don't ever want to upload malware directly to virus total, a place like that. If your adversaries are watching, you can just give them indication that you got the unit caught them. So I'm not advocating that. I'm saying once you understand the threat, you can find like key hashes and things like that. You can go search in a variety of means to find hashes and IOCs without tipping your adversary. But here we have like this little threat intelligence consumption team now. They did nothing fancy, no special NSA sauce of intel. They were just taking an understanding of their environment and the threat they have in their environment, going out and finding additional information and driving that back to the process. So they would take that and cycle back around and over time, your security team will get better, your defenders will learn, they'll grow. <coughs> the adversary is not growing as fast as everyone likes to say. Oh, we see adversaries consistently getting better and better. No, we consistently see them jacking FBN, uh, VPN connections into environments, using low level exploits, etc. Yes, the one or two epic tour log kind of campaigns that we see are pretty snazzy, but they're not hitting the world, it's all the other threats we're doing with, right? So it's a very sort of manageable process. So in that sort of 50-minute data dump, let's think about the big picture here. When we think about information sharing from this whole hack defense process we through. A lot of folks don't understand the behind the scenes look. There are various sources and methods that the intelligence community looks for to go find indicators, to find national adversaries, etc. But when they have all that, they'll usually have to pass it down to like the FBI or DHS, etc., who will eventually go to those public partnerships like uh, ISACs, ISAOs, etc., and push it down in these environments. The behind the scenes picture is they have no clue how relative or relevant a lot of those IOCs are. They're pushing them out to the community to say, hey, we think this is pretty good. But they need feedback to say, yes, we're seeing this in sectors that you weren't. Yes, we're seeing these indicators and these new ones. And when that community starts sharing that, we get a bigger, nicer picture. But unfortunately, a lot of folks don't know why they're sharing the data or why the government wants the data back, so they don't get a whole lot of good process. And realistically, this section right here of the public-private partnerships, these ISACs, end up being like a nice little parallel parable, uh, with rock soup. Basically, for those who are the parable, a uh, guy in the middle of town has a nice bucket of water, a nice uh, cauldron of water. He's really, really hungry. He says, okay, I'll have a rock. So he throws the rock in the water and tries to convince everybody that the rock stew is the best thing ever. And he says, that have any of you guys contribute something? And by the end of the day, when they actually partake in it, everybody's contributed so much from what they had and what they want, that the stew is actually really good. That's the model that I said. They've got nothing. Right? They're trying to get the government to give them data, they're trying to get the private partners to actually give them data as well, and they're trying to convince everybody at the end of the day that that rock soup is going to taste delicious. That, unfortunately, is information sharing and blah, 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 right? Unless we all start sharing the data, it's never going to be good for the end. So with that sort of spew through of 55 minutes, any questions? Sure. Yeah, let's get going. Um, you know, I said sort of rock soup, and some of my socks actually have some smooth. 
no share with the others that just have rocks. Yeah, yeah, the side stack, yeah, side stack, all the really rock and roll. Right. And then it sucks. Yep. And you see the same line of seeds across all of them, typically. Any thoughts on how to improve communication with those shared Oh, that's man. Good question. All right. So that's like the question I always get at like policy level for like how we make this better. To me, you have to understand the cultural and technical barriers in what the community are doing. I generally go back to ICS, which is the industrial control system community, and I like using them as a lesson learned because it, you probably don't know a ton about control systems in these environments. So you're not relying on technical experience, you're thinking about analysis and problem sets. That's why I like to use my example. In the ICS community, it is a technical issue about getting data, but it's so much more about the cultural and empowering those individuals to make uh, submissions of data and give data out of the environment. As an example, if your nuclear power site gives up indicators to compromise to anybody outside of that ISAC, they get sued for them, right? So there's usually green activists that say, hey, I don't want the nuclear power plant to be there. And they'll say, oh, look, it's compromised and it's ditch on it. Health issues in the entire nation that they had conflict from their network. And then you gotta try to argue that with the sort of lame populace, it's not gonna go very well, right? So ultimately, they're very scared of sharing. So the ISAOs that came out, unfortunately, it's going to be a whole new problem. But the idea of making it safer to share data and not have to wear the runtime laws was a good start. That next piece has to be the business justification. Why do those companies care in the first place? Uh, in a large portion of the organizations we see, they're not to the place where they understand the business case for security, let alone information sharing. There's a lot of work to be done on site in those organizations just to get over to that maturity point to do it. Um, but if I'm going to try to answer your question in sort of a one second spiel, I would say the next big thing is for the government to declassify a lot of the stuff that it thinks is important. There was a significant portion of things that I saw on a day-to-day -day basis that had no business being classified and starting and kickstarting that process. Generally speaking, the DOD is the only organization on the planet that can actually invest in security without having to make a business case for it. Uh, I remember Day one, standing up critical infrastructure mission, it's still a new mission for critical infrastructure, identifying nation states breaking in. And I get this three letter agency that passes me a top secret no more document. So here I am, I'm going to do my Snowden moment for everybody. I'm going to tell you what the top secret no more document said. Critical infrastructure is vulnerable to cyber attacks. Yeah. Thank you, I'm done. You know, we are, woo, not learning, right? So there's a lot of trash that's classified. Uh, if we would start going through it and look through, we have to push out the community, we can kickstart the community. The downside is for a lot of those players is they don't know what they have and what's trash and they're sort of afraid to go and say, hey, I have this top secret report. And it's not good, as good as the crowd strike and fire right report, and that's really embarrassing because ours costs a lot more, so we'll keep it to ourselves. I've seen better intelligence reports in the private sector than a lot of the intelligence reports I saw in the government. So they've got to sort of bite the bullet on that and say it's a hard problem, but let's get started and that'll help the information share. Next question, sir. Uh, do you see something to be proactive searching? Yeah, so proactive searches, I've seen a couple companies do it very well. There's a large infrastructure company that has a cyber intelligence team and they understand the difference between consuming and generating intelligence. That team's responsibility was to generate intelligence. And so they went into dark web, et cetera, forums, all sorts of good stuff, and they found that there was Chinese organizations that were using their intellectual property to build control systems. But the problem was they weren't validated, tested, et cetera, based off of the standards they should be kept to. But they're being put into Chinese national infrastructure. The downside of that company, the business case that was made, was if these blow up, so what that we didn't get our money? It's still going to say our company's name on the side of it, even if it's a knockoff. And that's a brand issue. And we need to actually go under as a company for something we had nothing to do. So they took that intelligence and they started working with law enforcement in China. They didn't even go through the DHS and State Department, they used their own sort of ways. Worked with law enforcement in China. And said, look, we'll replace it for free. We won't embarrass you in national media because your culture is a big thing to you. We're not going to embarrass you. What we'll do instead is we'll replace the equipment for free. But you prosecute those individuals. Chinese government prosecute the individuals, they went to jail, the infrastructure got replaced, and that company had been win. So using intelligence to that means is very useful, but understanding what you're using it for. Deep web uh, fixed architecture issues that you have with your own organization is not going to help you. So just understand the difference so you can find value in it. Sure. Questions? Nothing else? Too easy. All right, I sure do appreciate your time. Thank you for letting me come talk to y'all. Have a great day.